a pleasure for me to be here with you this morning, and I want to thank you for your interest and your work in what I consider to be a vital topic. And this may not be the biggest meeting that is going on in Washington this morning, but uh, it portends to be one of the most significant, because this is an issue that can turn the direction of our country. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has recently informed the President that the single greatest threat to our national security is our national debt. Congressman Paul Ryan, who has dedicated himself very aggressively to taking on our national debt and deficit, has said that if you want to be honest about the debt and deficit, <coughs> you have to see that it is, at its heart, a health care problem. That is probably the only point <laughs> on which Paul Ryan and I agree. <laughs> but it is significant, and it gives you a scale of the importance of the problem we're facing, because you combine those two statements by, I guess, it's the commutative principle, and guess what the number one threat to our national security is? It's our health care problem. Now we're going to face this in Medicare. There are already proposals out there within a decade to get rid of Medicare as we know it and to put the risk of excess cost and future cost increases onto seniors who heretofore have been protected from that risk. I think that is a grievous miscalculation and indeed a fundamental misdiagnosis of our health care problem. Our fundamental health care problem is a health care system cost problem. It doesn't matter who your insurer is, whether you're insured by Medicare or Medicaid, VA or TRICARE, United or Kaiser or Blue Cross, in the last decade plus you have seen costs go through the roof. We are paying 200 times the health care costs that we paid when I was born as a nation. We are burning 18% of our gross domestic product in health care. The next least efficient country in the world is burning only 12% of its GDP on health care. And you have to go far down the list of competitors before you find one that is having as poor health care outcomes as we are having for our vast <coughs> health care expense. So when you're dealing with a simple problem of a benefit, like an insurance benefit, for instance, uh, that pays for uh, something that is delivered through a system and it results in a cost, if the cost is unsustainable, which it is, there are really only two places you can look. One is to the benefit and one is to the system. And nobody of good faith could look at our current delivery system in the United States of America and not believe that that is the place where we need to first focus our attention. It has one problem, which is that if you take the benefit and you shift it, reduce it, cut it, and leave the system as a given, the mathematics of what you will save is easy to compute. That is the single benefit of attacking the benefit. The problem is that it creates immense pain, anxiety, and dislocation among people who don't deserve it, and it maintains a Rube Goldberg delivery system as a given, where our attention, all of the other signals about cost tell us that our attention needs to go. If you look at the President's own Council of Economic Advisors report, he tells us that the excess cost in the health care system that could be removed without compromising the quality of care, I would contend while actually increasing the quality of care, is $700 billion a year. When we talk in budget numbers around here, we multiply by 10 because there's a 10-year budget horizon. So that makes it a $7 trillion issue. If you look at the New England Healthcare Institute's review of the same question, it's $850 billion a year. If you look at what the Lewin Group and former Bush Treasury Secretary O'Neill calculated at, it's a trillion dollars a year. 
So it's a huge target. It not only is, according to Admiral Mullen, our greatest national security threat, it is also perhaps our most significant national economic opportunity. So we have to go at it, and how do we go at it? I think there are five strategies that we need to deploy to go at it. One is improving the quality of the delivery of care. The best example of that is reducing hospital-acquired infections, applying the Pronovost principles, preventing the two and a half billion dollars that we spend every year treating line infections that are spread in our hospitals. Two and a half billion dollars a year just on that procedure. The second is prevention. We have not done a very good job of sorting out which prevention methods actually save money in the long run. We need to be really diligent about that and deliberate about it, and we need to go out and we need to support those prevention strategies so that we are preventing disease. Obviously, the most expensive way to deal with it, the most inexpensive way to deal with the disease is to prevent it in the first place. The third is to pay doctors for outcomes, not for the multiplicity of procedures and tests that they order. And the fourth is to knock down the warfare overpayment. Whether it's 10 or 15 or 20 percent, depending on where you are and what program you're in, there is a huge chunk of the private insurance health care dollar that goes to insurance company overhead most of which is dedicated to delaying and denying payment to hospitals and to doctors. Which means that it casts a cost shadow on the healthcare system for the hospitals and doctors who then have to hire people to fight back. That's not clearly reported, but it has to be at least as much as the insurance companies spend because they're more efficient at it. The Little Cranston Community Health Center in Cranston, Rhode Island is a small place along the side of a busy street. Half of its personnel are dedicated to fighting to get paid, and they have to pay a consultant $200,000 a year to help guide them through the payment morass. So those are four important strategies, but there's a fifth, and the fifth is what brings us here today, and that's health information technology. Not only is a robust, secure health information infrastructure for this country a good end in itself from a point of view of addressing the cost issue, but all of those other four strategies are enabled, empowered, and advanced by a robust health information infrastructure. In fact, some of them really cannot be effectively done without it. So you can draw very logically and very clearly a line between the worst national security problem that the United States of America faces, the health care problem that drives that debt, the solution in delivery system reform with hundreds of billions of dollars to be had, and health information infrastructure as a critical platform to enable that to take place. So that is why I say that this may not be the biggest meeting in Washington, but I think it is one of the most important. And we have to buckle down and continue to push forward on this, because the costs of failing to do so are very, very high. So I really want to encourage all of you in what you're doing. I'm not going to dwell on these remarks because I made them last night, and many of you were here, but what I've described is the current problem and the solution set that I think can actually address that current problem in a way that is a win-win for our country. I mean, look at those five different strategies. Assume none of them saved a nickel. You'd still want a secure electronic health record that was there wherever you needed it when you went to the hospital, or to the doctor, or were taken sick while you were traveling. You would still want to have Line infections, hospital-acquired infections knocked down to pretty close to never events, which is where they should be. You'd still want that. You'd still want illness prevented to the maximum economic level for your own self and for your own family. You would still want your doctor to have the incentive, the financial incentive, to get you well and to keep you well rather than to order the maximum procedures and the maximum tests. And you would still want 
that warfare between providers and insurance companies to go away and not to be embroiled in it yourself when you or a loved one have a very significant illness and very significant expenses. Anybody who's been through that knows what a ghastly nightmare that provider payment battle can be. So even if it didn't get us any money at all, these would still be things that we should be doing just as a matter of public good. And when they promise to save a significant chunk of that 700 billion or 850 billion or trillion dollars a year, it puts a lot of motivation into it. But there's also a going forward part. I think we're at the beginning, as I said yesterday, of a new industry. And just as some industries look awkward at the beginning, we look a little awkward right now. We're trying to sort out how an ACO should work and what it should look like. And what should meaningful use of health information technology be? And who should be included? And how do you connect to health information infrastructure with quality models? And how do you build the beginnings of the kind of decision support that pilots have every minute that they're flying an aircraft into the lives of the doctors who take care of all of us? We're a little bit like the early days of flight. People knew the principles. They knew that a curved wing generated lift. They knew that a whirling air, spray, air screw propelled you forward. And they knew that if you twisted the ends of the wings, you could control your direction. But some of those early planes looked pretty funny. The craft that the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk looked like a box. The aircraft biplane made out of wood, canvas covered in varnish, that my grandfather flew in France in World War I was a preposterous little vehicle. The dive bomber that my father flew in World War II was considerably better. And nowadays, I come back from the war in Iraq and Afghanistan in a jet, in pressurized splendor, landing at Dulles with TVs playing and people bringing me tea and comfortable chairs and a group literally the size of a small American town of the 1920s, all landing at once at well over 100 miles an hour with nobody thinking two things about it. Because the principles didn't change. We're still generating lift by a curved wing. We're still generating thrust by twirling propeller blades. Now they're in a jet. And we're still steering the thing with those ailerons out at the end of the wings. But we've gotten better at it. And we figured out what else you can add, how you can go from canvas to metal, how you can go from open cabins to pressurized cabins, how you can make these things bigger and safer and support them with an enormous amount of, guess what, information technology. So I think there's going to be enormous growth in this and enormous opportunity, both in terms of the development of apps that will support individualized care and in the aggregation and uh, digestion, whatever you call it, of the data that will be provided by this so that we can learn from the various anomalies and associations that are revealed when we begin to have access to data at this level. And I think it's just really, really exciting. So I encourage you in what you are doing. It is not just important economically to you and to the companies you work with and the organizations you work with, but it's critically important to our country. It is a great economic opportunity for us in the years ahead and it is the most humane and sensible and proper solution to our current health care cost problem, which to close where I began, is the number one national security problem America faces, because it is what is driving our debt and our deficit. So thank you very much. Des, you want to take a few questions from the audience? Unless you're not fully caffeinated yet, not ready to questions. I <laughs> know it's early. Yes? Hi, Senator Lee Rochelle from All Scripts. Hey, Lee. Good to see you. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, I, the Paul Ryan proposal included nothing to do with um, payment for outcomes, you know, all of this, which is health IT enabled. And none of the other counter proposals that I've seen include that as well, right? So shifting yeah. more for that pay for value. The only thing that I've seen is um, the proposal from the AMA and their coalition as to how we should adjust the SGR. Yeah. So, you know, moving five years from now to that model. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that or have had any other conversations that might say, you know, behind the scenes there is acknowledgement of, of the importance of that movement. It goes back to the problem of the uh, 
what we in Washington call scoring. Many years ago, I did a reform in Rhode Island of our workers' compensation system, which was then our worst nightmare. It was the worst in the country, except for one that had gone completely into insolvency. And we faced the same choice. Do you cut the benefit or do you reform the system? And we had Wyatt, the actuarial firm, come in and look over our shoulders to prove that this was going to be the serious reform, the once and for all moment. And the problem that Wyatt brought with them was that actuaries can look at certain things and they can deduce certain things, and other things just befuddle them. They just can't deal with it. It just isn't part of what actuarial science permits them to accomplish. No fault on them, it's just a limitation of the science. So if you want to cut the benefit to the workers' comp uh, worker, the injured worker, they can do the math on that really quickly. If you want to knock down the payment to the provider, you can do the math on that really quickly. And you can come up with a result that you can say, okay, here's the $160 million we need to save this year. We're good. Once you get into fixing the delivery system, the actuarial science just founders. It just doesn't work any longer. So when De Medici uh, and uh, Rivlin came into our budget committee for their hearing, when Bowles and Simpson came into our budget committee uh, for their hearing, I asked them the exact same question both times. I asked about this, the delivery system reform piece and why it wasn't in there. And they said, you've got to do this, this is the most important thing. Every single one of them agreed. But we can't do the math with it. We can't figure it out. And so we don't know what it's going to lead to. You can nibble off little threads. You can nibble off 30-day readmissions to hospitals. And we've done that, and there's a number on that. You can nibble off hospital part infections to a degree, and so there's a number on that, and we've done that. But beyond those very, very small, particularly well-proven uh, efforts, uh, what do you call it, I guess, examples of the theory in practice, you begin to push it further, and it's just so hard. You know, it's like a voyage, what Atul Gawande called it, a voyage of innovation and experimentation and learning. And it has corners. And the actuaries can't see around those corners. You don't know uh, when you're going to get to the West Coast if you are you know, headed off to do the expedition. You just know you need to. And so that's what's been the problem. That's what's been so hard about pushing it into the debate. And if anyone here has the ear of the White House or of anybody in the White House, the thing that I say more often than anything else about this is the actuaries can't predict where delivery system reform can go. But the president's in a position to direct it. And many years, about 50 years ago now, if I have the math right, pretty close on exactly 50 years ago, President Kennedy gave a rather memorable speech. At the time, Sputnik had gone overhead. Americans were scared to death of the Russians. The nuclear threat was upon us. There was a space race going on. We were losing the space race. And President Kennedy stepped to the microphone, and he did not say, I am going to see to it that America bends the curve of space exploration. If he'd said that, not much would have happened as a result. We would have completely forgotten the speech. It would have been a nothing in our national history. Instead, he said, we're going to put a person on the moon. We're going to do it in a decade, and we're going to bring them home safely. And that galvanized the entire federal structure onto that purpose and moved them in a way that a bland and uh, non-accountable metric never could have. And I think it's time for the White House to step up and put a really good, solid metric, or maybe two or three, out there as to where delivery system reform will be and when, and put a number to it, and then we can debate the number. But at least it will have that kind of, at least it will be on the table. And until that happens, there's no way for anybody else to get on the table. Because we in Congress can't force the executive branch to implement any fast. They don't work for us. We can yell at them. We can hound them. We can harangue them. We can have hearings that point out things that they're not doing right or that they are doing right. But we can't provide that kind of direction. And that is what I think is needed to answer the, the problem. That's why it's not in the debate right now. You can't put a number on it. Everybody wants to put a number on what they're doing. It's the great disability of delivery system reform. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day.